Good morning. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. Happy Easter. <laughs> It is a glorious day. Glorious, glorious, let us rejoice. Glorious, glorious, lifting our voice. We who were hopeless are now victorious. Praise our Redeemer. Glorious, glorious. Welcome to worship this morning at New Salem. And now that you're awake, happy Easter! Hey, for, uh, for those who, of you who are new, I, uh, I usually try to avoid politics from this platform, but uh, on occasion things happen that uh, require some comment. So let me just say this, from news reports this weekend, I gather some of our politicians up in Washington appear to be a little confused over what Easter is all about. So let me say very clearly why we're here today, okay? Uh, whatever this day may mean for other people, for us, it's all about celebrating Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Amen. Easter means He is risen. And that fact changes everything. And that's why we have come together to celebrate today. And we have several people who are with us as guests today. We are so grateful that you're here. We are thankful that you're here. We want you to feel at home. Uh, you've already done the hard part today. You've come across the threshold. And so now we just want you to sit back and feel at home. And if there's anything we can do to help you with that, let us know, please. Um, if you, you are here for the first time, we would appreciate the chance to get to know you a little bit. And if you're ready to start that conversation, you got a choice of ways to uh, do that that are easy and, uh, and low pressure. One, you'll notice on the back of every pew, there is a QR code. And you can simply take your smartphone and scan that, and that'll take you to a website where you can introduce yourself and ask for information about the church. And if you're joining us online, that same QR code's on your screen right now. You can do the same thing 
or just go to NewSalemBaptist.net and you'll find that information there as well. If you prefer, if you like you know, having that physical card in your hand, you'll find that on the back of the pew as well. It's a little white card in blue ink. It says, let's make a connection. And you can just fill it out. Let us know the way you prefer to be contacted. And then when we pass the offering plate in a little while, you can just drop it in there. Or if you need a little more time after the service, you'll notice on the back wall there's a white box. You just drop it in the slot. And sometime this week, we'll simply reach out to you to make sure that we made you feel welcome today. But we are so thankful that you are here. We, a few of you may have come yesterday for our cruise in. Understand, we had 108 cars here on display yesterday. That's the largest we have ever had. So thanks to everybody who worked to make that possible. It's just a way we can meet our community and get to know folks. Um, a couple of things that are, are special about today, besides the fact that it's Easter, one is as part of our worship today, we are going to observe what we call the Lord's Supper. And different churches do this in different ways. So let me explain how it works in our church. For us, the Lord's Supper is a powerful, symbolic reminder of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so you do not have to be a formal member of New Salem in order to participate in this with us, but we do ask that you only participate if you are a born-again, baptized believer. Uh, later in the service, those who are going to participate will be invited to come up here to one of these tables to get the uh, wafer and the juice that we use to share the Lord's Supper together. And if you choose not to participate, and there's lots of reasons why somebody might, might decide they don't want to participate, just stay in your seat. Nobody's going to ask any questions. There's no pressure, okay? Uh, but if you are going to participate, we'll let you know when to come down and get the elements. We'll do it row by row, and then we'll give further instructions about how we're going to observe this together. Something else that's special about today's service, uh, every week in the middle of the service, usually we collect an offering. That's how our New Salem members and friends help support the day-to-day -day ministries of our church. But this time of year, we also collect a very special offering called the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering for North American Missions. And some of our people came today prepared to give to that special offering. That, we're going to wait till the very end of the service. You'll be giving instructions. If you're planning to give to the Annie Armstrong Offering today, and some people, that's kind of a special thing for them on Easter, we'll give you some instructions on how you can participate that in a little while. So just, just be aware, if you brought an Annie Armstrong gift, you'll have another opportunity later in the service to be able to share that. Uh, now let's go ahead and continue to worship Jesus as our choir comes to lead us. Darkness into 
Good morning. It is good to praise God. It is good to pray to a living God, not one who's in the grave, not one who's still on the cross, but one who is resurrected and one who is at the right hand of the Father. Praise God. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that the resurrected Christ not only has shown us that our sins were paid for completely, that sin no longer has any hold on Christ because he's paid for our sins, but it no longer has hold on us and that we live a resurrected life. Thank you, God, for the freedom that we have. Lord, help us to just live in that exercising of our freedom. Lord, we, we have these petitions. We pray for these people, these people, these individuals, uh, these uh, concerns that we have. Lord, we pray for for Freddie Weiss, for Steve Powell, for David York, for Dave Donnelly, for Wayne Bolt. Lord, we pray for Darla Dawson, Ronnie Hankins, Steve Powell, Betty Christian, Susan Sims, Terry Elsie, Glenn Massengale, Joyce Aslinger, Maddie Weller, Jean Lee, Skylar Hurd, Jackie Barker, Charles Clayton, Lamar Rogers, Jerry Caldwell, Richard Spangler, Sonia Bowles, Elizabeth Towater, Priscilla Poe, Gladys Spangler, Mary Adams, Charlotte Gooden, Charles and Barbara Rogers, Rebecca Rogers, Holly Hatmaker, Elizabeth Mayfield, Martha Hudson, Lois and Ken Johnson, Margaret Spangler, Kathy Shrum, Nancy Duran, Shirley Cox, Judy Jordan, June Allison. Lord, we pray your special blessing upon you know each one of these. You know their needs. You know their physical needs. Lord, the emotional, the spiritual. Lord, the, the needs interpersonal. And we ask that you would just have your hand of goodness upon each of these individuals. May your blessing be upon them. And Lord, may they know it is your hand and realize your presence in their lives. And may we and they bring glory to you praising you for what you do. Lord, we pray also for our church that you will send us the musicians that you deem that we need. We pray for New Salem staff and ministries. We pray for the missionaries that our church supports through uh, uh, the outreach with the Southern Baptist Convention. Lord, we pray for others that are, are giving the gospel to Throughout the world that may not be under that umbrella, but love you and are giving the gospel. We pray for our president and leaders that they'll be uh, such as will follow you. And Lord, we pray for the military men and women, the health care workers and school teachers, fire and police, first responders. We pray for our nation as a whole. Uh, Lord, we pray that we'll turn to you. Lord, give us, grant us repentance. And Lord, grant us the blessings that would come through our repentance. Lord, we pray for the staff and teachers and students at our schools here in Hamilton County, but throughout the nation, that those who are Christians will be able to uh, freely express the gospel there. And Lord, help us that are not involved in schools that we'll express the gospel. And, bring people to you. 
Lord, we pray for the conflict that is happening in Israel and with the release of the hostages there, that those hostages will be released. And Lord, that you'll bring this conflict to a close and Lord, uh, that people's lives will be saved. But more than that, that people will be brought to you through it. Lord, we, we pray for our, our church here this morning. May we bring glory and honor to you in all that we do. Lord, fill us with your spirit. As we worship you, fill our pastor with your spirit as he brings the message to us. And may all that we do uh, be in accord with your will and bring honor and glory to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. in the whisper if you listen closely winter means the spring is just a breath away so don't go any faster than this very moment sing a hallelujah in the pouring rain can't you see that you must have known about the
As our ushers come forward, let me thank those of you who have been so faithful this past month to support your church. We can't do what we do without your help. So let's go, Lord, in prayer as we prepare to receive this offering. Father, we come to you as the one who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Lord, you give us the ability to, to earn a living. You give us the ability to produce what we have. And Lord, we realize you don't bless us just for us to be reservoirs to hold those blessings to ourselves. But Father, you bless us so that we can be channels of blessing to other people. And so we come to this offering now, and Lord, we give willingly and cheerfully because we want other people to have the chance to experience you like we have and to hear the good news about the Savior, Jesus. So Lord, bless this offering. Let it grow and use it for your glory so that the message of Jesus can go around the world. It's in his name we pray. Amen. There are so many that don't know Jesus in the city of Boston. I lead the Beloved Initiative, which is an anti-trafficking and sexual abuse awareness campaign. My ministry right now looks like reaching our refugee friends and their families, our homeless friends, and also women who are experiencing exploitation. There are so many parts to the equation. We look for, you know, creative ways to, you know, meet needs. I'm really passionate about gifting essential products, but it's the importance of leaving the pews and going out and being the light and love of Jesus. We have volunteers within our churches. We're creating, you know, earrings and bracelets to then use those for our street outreach. We can um, just bless um, women that are in strip clubs or on the street. And the goal is just really that the loss will be reached with the love of Christ. When people give to the Annie Armstrong offering, uh, individuals are receiving Christ and realizing their beloved identities as beloved sons and daughters. Your generous support is going towards so many individuals who do not have a relationship with Jesus, helping them realize that they are loved and loved by Christ. Part of the service where we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. So I'm going to invite you to come forward row by row to come by one of the tables and pick up the cup that has the wafer and the juice in it and then return to your seat. We'll start one row at a time and as the row in front of you comes through, be ready to follow those of you who are participating today. If you would, if you exit your row on the left, come back around and re-enter from the right. And while we do that, our worship team is going to uh, lead us this, in a song and feel free to sing along and worship with us while everyone is, is getting their, their elements. And what, let me also recommend this. If you're sitting next to someone who maybe is a little challenged in the area of mobility, why don't you uh, offer, say, hey, you want me to bring one back for you? And let's help, help them out. So if we'll all stand, those of you who are going to participate, and begin making our way to pick up the cup and the juice.
The Gospels tell us that on the, you may be seated, excuse me. The Gospels tell us that on the Thursday night before he's arrested, Jesus gathered with his 12 closest followers to celebrate the Jewish feast of Passover. Passover in itself is a very symbolic meal commemorating the release of the Hebrew slaves from bondage in Egypt under Moses thousands of years before. And every item that's included on that menu has significance and helps tell the story of that deliverance. And that night as Jesus celebrated that observance with his disciples, he picked two of the items on the table and he gave them a new significance, which is where our observance comes from. Uh, you received a cup that has, has two compartments. One has a, a wafer of unleavened bread. The other has the fruit of the vine. And the way this will work, I'm going to invite you to very carefully open the compartment that has the wafer of bread and take that and just hold it. I'm going to share some scripture with you. We're going to share the wafer together, and then we're going to pray. And then we're going to do the same thing with the juice. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives us an interpretation of what this represents. And he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that by the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for offering your perfect unblemished body for our sakes. A body that had never known sin. So unlike our bodies, which are well familiar with sin. But Lord, out of your great love for us, you offered yourself in our place. The stripes we deserve, you took upon your own back. The nails we deserve, you took in your own wrists and feet. And Lord, you offer your body for us so that by your stripes, we can be made whole. Lord, may we never forget the great gift you have offered us in standing in our place so that we could share in your eternal life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Now, if we very carefully open the other compartment, Paul goes on and says, in the same way, he took the cup also after the supper and saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for allowing your blood to be shed. Thank you that your blood seals a covenant between us and God. A, a covenant that can never be broken. A covenant of grace and mercy. Thank you that your blood covers over our sins and our flaws. So when the Father looks on us, he no longer sees us and our brokenness, but he sees us through the, the filter of your sinless, perfect blood. And Father, may we honor the sacrifice of Jesus. May we remember the price that was paid for our salvation. May we proclaim the beauty of that gift to everyone we can. And may we live in ways that honor that sacrifice. We pray this in Jesus' name, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Paul tells us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What we've just done is one way of proclaiming the gospel. I'm going to encourage you to take your Bibles now and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 5. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's one in the pew in front of you. You're probably going to want to have this in front of you so you can follow through and see what we're going to be looking at this morning. While you're finding that, today is kind of a special day for me. Uh, not only is it Easter, but today marks 34 years since my wife and I stood before God and our family and said our wedding vows to each other. So after 34 years, I got my wife something very special for her anniversary. I got her a fan. 
And about now, some of you are saying, what an idiot. Why would you get your wife a fan as an anniversary present? I mean, that's not romantic at all. But before you write me off, hear me out, okay? See, I love my wife. And I think she loves me to put up with me for 34 years. But I love my wife and I want her to have what she needs. And after 34 years of living under the same roof, I know one of the things she needs is a good night's rest. Uh, In order to get a good night's sleep, she needs the room to be cool. And she needs the white noise that the fan generates in order to sleep. Now, her fan broke a few weeks ago. So because I love her and I want her to get a good night's sleep, I got her a new fan. Don't laugh, because I'm I'm not saying all I'm getting her for anniversary. Later this week, I'm going to get her a couple gallons of paint, too. (laughs) Because what she really wants for her anniversary is for me to redo our bedroom, which hasn't been touched since we moved in 15 years ago. Uh, So that's probably how I'm spending most of my free time the next couple of weeks, just so you'll know. If you're looking for me, just I'll have the paintbrush. Now, what in the world has that got to do with Easter? Well, I'm assuming most people that are here today know the basic outline of what happened at that first Easter. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a Sunday to the acclamation of his followers. He spent the week arguing with the religious authorities and teaching the common people. And on Thursday, he celebrated the Jewish Passover, like we've just remembered, with his disciples. And then he was arrested while he was praying in a local olive grove. He faced a couple of sham trials and was convicted of committing sedition against Rome. And so on Friday morning, the Romans crucified him outside the walls of the city. And on Friday evening, he was buried in a borrowed tomb that was guarded by armed soldiers and sealed with the procurator's official seal to keep anyone from stealing the body. And then on Sunday morning, the entrance of the tomb rolled away, the guards were scared away, and witnesses encountered a living, breathing Jesus. That's the what of Easter. This morning, I want to spend a few minutes focusing on the why of Easter. And the truth is, Easter represents the greatest demonstration of love that the world has ever seen. God knew exactly what we needed. And because he loved us, he gave. And one of the clearest depictions of that love is found here in this chapter of Romans. Romans chapter 5, a letter that Paul wrote to the early church in Rome. And uh, starting in verse 6. Paul writes this, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received the reconciliation. We call the gospel good news, but the presence of good news also implies what? There's some bad news, right? And Paul hits us with it in both barrels in this paragraph. He says some things about us that were true before we came to Christ. Some of these things are pretty hard to, pretty hard to hear. He says, first of all, before Christ, we are helpless. And when Paul describes us as helpless, what he means is that without God's intervention, we are completely unable to alter our spiritual condition in a meaningful way. In other places, Paul would uh, describe our condition apart from Christ as being dead. For example, Romans 3.23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then a couple of chapters later, he comes back to that thought in Romans 6.23, excuse me, yeah, 6.23, and says, For the wages of sin, what we earn by virtue of being a sinner is death. In one of his other letters, Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2, he says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, 
in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Paul says we are all dead. And when Paul says we are dead, he doesn't mean that we're dead physically. Although that would be the natural end result. What he means is we were dead spiritually. As in completely lifeless and inert in relation to God. Think of it this way. The Bible tells us in Genesis that God breathed into human beings the breath of life. He's the source of our spiritual life. However, the Bible also claims that every single one of us struggles with this inborn inclination to turn away from God and to do things on our own. We don't want his help. We don't want his authority. We want to be in control. So you tell me, when, if God is our source of life and we turn away from our source of life, what are we embracing? Death. Dead people are helpless people. Several years ago, while we were living in New Orleans, we decided one day to go to one of the local malls to get some ice cream. It was a big mall, one of these double-deckers, kind of like Hamilton Place. And we're up on the second floor enjoying our ice cream, and all of a sudden we hear some commotion on the floor below us. So we looked over the rail, and there on the lower level was a gentleman who was obviously having cardiac arrest. It was a scary thing. And there was a paramedic leaning over him doing chest compressions. Now, I don't know whether or not that man survived. But I know this, at that moment, he was completely unable to help himself. His only hope was the intervention being offered by that paramedic. Listen, without an intervention from God, we would be completely helpless to change our spiritual condition. The problem is, according to Paul, is that before Christ, not only are we helpless, we are it says in verse 6, ungodly. So in the same sentence, he links these two together. Think about that. The people whose only hope for spiritual survival is the intervention from God are without God. And we're without God, not because God has rejected us, but because we reject him. The original human sin was not eating an apple. The original human sin is the choice to reject God's authority and set ourselves up as our own God. That's exactly what Adam and Eve chose in the Garden of Eden. That's why they call it the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. You ever looked at one of God's commands in, in the Bible and said, well, that seems awful old-fashioned. You know, I think people ought to be allowed to do and fill in the blank. There's a lot of that going on today, by the way. <laughs> Congratulations, you ever done that? You just promoted yourself to Godhood. You've become your own God, deciding for yourself what's right and wrong. The problem is, is our ideas of what's right and wrong often fall short of God's ideas, and God's are the ones that count. Why should God stoop to help people who've chosen to turn their backs on him? Not only are we ungodly, Paul says, verse 7, we're unworthy. In verse 7, he reminds us that uh, it's truly rare for one person to sacrifice himself for another. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, although perhaps for the good man, somebody would dare even to die. So when somebody sacrifices himself for somebody else, we usually make a pretty good deal about it. Uh, when someone chooses to sacrifice his life in place of someone else, it's usually because the one who is being saved is either considered too innocent or too important to be allowed to die. I mean, would you risk your life for somebody like, say, Jonas Salk, who could potentially develop a cure for a terrible disease that affl afflicts millions of people? That might be somebody you might say, that person's important, maybe we need to make sure they stick around. Would you be more likely to give your life for that person or for Adolf Hitler? The person who's a war criminal and a mass murderer I think a lot of us would look at Adolf Hitler and say, no, no, that, that guy ain't worth it. He can, he can be toast. In essence, what Paul is saying is that we're the ones who are not worth it. 
because Paul claims we are, in verse 8, sinners. Literally, that word sinners means people who miss the mark. Paul makes this bold claim that when it comes to righteousness, every single one of us have missed that mark. Now, he does this in kind of a clever way. In Romans chapter 1, Paul reminds us there's a final reckoning coming. Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And throughout the Bible, there's this, this promise, this theme that one day God is going to step in and end evil and injustice and suffering. And he's going to rescue the righteous. Now, most of us, we look at the world and say, yeah, there's a lot of evil, injustice, and suffering. I wish God would do something about it. Guess what? He says he's going to one day. So, you know, we ought to be cheering on, right? When God says, or excuse me, Paul says in uh, 1, he goes on to argue that this wrath is going to be targeted against people who are blatantly irreverent, evil, and degenerate. He describes people that are thumbing their nose at God, shaking their fist at him, and living as pagans, and just... You, know, you read the description and say, yeah, we, most of us would look at those people and say, yeah, yeah, those people deserve it. You know, those, those, are, those are prime targets for God's wrath. You know, yeah, we, they're, they're not like us. And so Paul gets us all, you know, saying, yeah, those people deserve it. But then he comes in chapter 2 and he turns the tables on us. Because in chapter 2 he starts to show how even people who were otherwise moral have fallen short through hypocrisy and judgmentalism. Romans 2, 3, what do you suppose, O oh man, that when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and, and do the same yourself, that you'll escape the judgment of God? See, the thing of, you know, even good people, we tend to do the same evils. We just call them by different names and do them to a different degree, if we're honest, right? Got really quiet all of a sudden. Maybe you've never actually killed anybody. But have you assassinated somebody's character through slander and gossip? Maybe you've never actually committed adultery. But have you ever looked at someone lustfully or objectified someone based on their attractiveness? Maybe you've never stolen from anybody or defrauded anyone. But how many of us have told those little white lies? You know, we can't do this anymore because we don't usually have a house phone. But I remember growing up, you know, sometimes somebody would call and my parents would say, tell them I'm not home. How many of us have ever done something like that? Mm, nervous laughter. So even good people have fallen short. And then Paul widens the focus out even a little more. He says, even religious people, those who claim to know God and have the truth, even we are guilty of hypocrisy and judgmentalism and falling short. So if even the really good people can't be good enough, what hope is there for the rest of us? In Romans 3, 19 and 20, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. In other words, one day we're going to find ourselves standing before God and we're not going to be able to deny all the junk and the garbage in our lives. He says, because the work, by the works of the flesh, no, excuse me, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. For all the, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We're all sinners. But because we're sinners, he says in verse 10, we are enemies. By virtue of being sinners and ungodly, we are enemies of God. James 4, verse 4, James says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? And when he talks about the world there, he's talking about this world society system that's always you know, chasing for the, for the buck and, and trying to get ahead, full of pride, full of greed. He says, to the extent we buy into that, we are enemies of God. In Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22, Paul points out that we were formerly alienated and hostile in mind and engaged in evil deeds. Apart from Christ, we are all those things. We are helpless, we're ungodly, we are unworthy, we are sinners, and we are enemies. But you know what else we are? According to Paul in verse 8, we're all those things, but we are also loved. Despite all those things, you may have all those things in your life, but hear me, God does not hate you. In fact, despite all those things, God loves you. And here's the most amazing fact. 
Paul says that even while we were all those things, while we were helpless, ungodly, unworthy, sinners and enemies, God still loved us. Go back and look at it in verse 8. Note, Paul doesn't say that God loved us after we repent and return to him. Paul doesn't say God started loving us after we got our act together and cleaned up. No, God loved us while we were still at war with him. You don't believe it? Look at what God's done for you. God demonstrated his love by coming into our world in the person of Jesus and laying down that life for yours. That's love. Through Christ, God took the fate we deserve upon himself. And he says this repeatedly in verse 6, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 10. Talking about through Christ, what we've received. For, see, for our sin, we deserve wrath and death. Jesus offered himself in our place. What do we see on the cross? On the cross, we see the all-powerful dying in place of the helpless. We see the one who is God dying in place of the ungodly. We, instead of someone dying for a righteous man, we see the righteous man dying for the unworthy. The one without sin dying in place of the sinful. And the one who was rejected dying in place of those who did the rejecting. Now, somebody may ask, well, how is it fair for God to put all that on Jesus? I mean, that's like picking an innocent third party and just kind of arbitrarily dumping all that on them. That's not what the Bible describes. Okay, remember, Christians, we profess, who was Jesus? Jesus was God's son. He was Emmanuel. He was God with us. So in Jesus, God is actually, he actually took upon himself what we deserved. Jesus taking our place on the cross is like the judge pronouncing our sentence and then reaching for his own wallet to pay our fine. And, and God did more than simply demonstrate his love for us on the cross. I mean, in itself, that would have been enough. However, Paul goes on to say, starting in verse 9, that God did much more than this. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. So in Christ, we are justified. Paul says that through Jesus' sacrifice, we have been justified. He states this in the present perfect tense. Now, I know it's been a long time since some of us took English. So let me remind you, what he's talking about there is an action that's taken place in the past that has a continuing effect into the present. In other words, Jesus' sacrifice affects a change in status for those who've put their faith in him. And that change in status reflects how God now sees us. Where before we were at war with God, after receiving Christ, our status is changed from enemy to justified. The slate is wiped clean. We are forgiven, and we now belong to him. He says also, not only are we justified, we are saved. In Christ, and he puts this in the future tense, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. Remember, we talked about that day of reckoning that the Bible predicts. When that day of reckoning finally arrives, when God's wrath is revealed finally and ultimately against all ungodliness and righteousness, Christ will shield all of those who belong to him. In my home, I have a fireproof box for securing important papers. And the reason for that box is that, heaven forbid, a fire should break out in our house, uh, those important papers will be protected. If you're in Christ, your soul is protected more securely than any fireproof box ever could. And if that weren't enough, Paul points out that if God went to all that trouble on behalf of those who were still enemies... Imagine how securely he will hold on to those who've accepted the gift that he offers us in Christ. As the Apostle Peter points out in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, you were not redeemed through perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You think the God who gave his own son for our sake is going to let go of us very easily? God's not likely to abandon something in which he has invested so much. As Jesus himself said in John 10, 29, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. When you come to Jesus, it's kind of like sliding across home plate. 
And the umpire of the universe looks at you and says, safe. But even better, it's not you that's sliding across the plate. It's Jesus serving as your designated hitter. We are saved in him. Not only that, more than that, we are revived. Uh, Note the the interesting way that Paul phrases these benefits in verse 10. Again, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we're reconciled with God through Jesus' death. We are saved by Jesus' life. The life Paul is talking about here is Jesus' resurrected eternal life. Because Jesus can never die again, he serves as the guarantee of God's promise. God's promise will never expire because Jesus can never face death again. Jesus shared in our death so that we could share in that resurrected life. Jesus said it this way in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Yes. He says again, John 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. In Romans 8, 11, we read, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. In other words, this eternal life business is not just about duration or quantity, it's also about the quality of life. And the same power that raised Jesus from that tomb 2,000 years ago and who will raise his followers from the dead in the future is available to you right now to help you live a life that's pleasing to God. That same power can be at work in your life. And then finally, he says, we are not only revived, we are reconciled in verse 11. And the word reconciled means to restore friendly relations or harmony. Three times in this paragraph, Paul mentions that Jesus' sacrifice makes it possible for us to be reconciled to God. Through Jesus, the enemies of God become his friends. Uh, Several years ago, uh, I was leading a group at a children's camp. I was at another church then uh, doing children's ministry. It's part of my responsibilities. Every year we took the kids to this camp. And one year we took the kids to this camp, and there was a band there, a group of guys from New Zealand, really cool band, guys called the the Lads. You can look them up on YouTube. This is back when the Wiggles were so huge. And these guys were kind of like, you know, the Wiggles on, on uh, uh, the gospel version of the Wiggles. But they had a song. One of the most popular songs that week was a song they sang called Creator. And the chorus says, my best friends, the creator of the universe. Although he's bigger than the Milky Way, he wants to know what about my life today. That's always stuck with me. If your best friend's the creator of the universe, what could you possibly be afraid of? You know, somebody was telling me about, uh, before, before the service started, about their brother, who is physically bigger than they are. He said, you know, in school, he was my bodyguard, you know. <laughs> if God is on your side, who can be against you? And in Jesus, those who were God's enemies are now God's friends. No wonder Paul says this truth ought to lead us to exult in God. It is too exciting to contain. So in Jesus, the helpless are rescued. The ungodly are transformed. The unworthy are given value. Sinners become saints. And enemies are made friends. All these blessings are made possible through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And all these blessings are made personal when you put your faith in Jesus and what he's done for you. Jesus made it possible, but you make it personal by surrendering to him unconditionally and joining with him in faith. When he was 18 years old, Hiro Onada joined the Imperial Japanese Army. He became an intelligence officer and a commando. In December of 1944, he was sent to the Philippines. His orders were to do all he could to hamper Allied advances on that island. And Onada was committed to his mission, even after Japan formally surrendered in 1945. He refused to surrender, and he remained in the Philippine jungle for over 30 years, 
struggling to survive, trying to evade capture, and launching the occasional guerrilla strike against targets on the island. It wasn't until 1974 when Onada's old commander came to the Philippines, tracked him down, and gave him a formal order to surrender that Onada finally laid down his weapons and came out of the jungle. He had wasted 30 years living in that jungle in defiance uh, for fighting a war that was already over. Some of you are out in the spiritual jungle today, struggling just to survive and trying your best to evade being captured by God. Maybe even shaking your fist in defiance in his faith, in his face. Listen, the war with God's over. That issue was decided 2,000 years ago on the cross and sealed when Jesus came out of that tomb. It's only a matter of time before that victory is made complete. How many years are you going to waste fighting a war that's already over? A little later in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, If you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with a mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Why not lay down your arms today and surrender and receive this gift of life that Jesus offers? Will you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. Lord, we recoil at the bad news. But Father, when we realize just how bad the news is, we understand how good Jesus is. And how good is the gift you offer us through him. Lord, if there's anybody that's here this morning, either in this room with me or watching online, who's never opened their heart and life up to Christ, I pray today your spirit will draw them to yourself. Help them to be transformed from an enemy to a friend. Help them to put down their arms, to stop struggling, and to open their lives up to you to receive this amazing gift that you've offered us through Jesus. Thank you for loving us even when we were unlovable. And thank you for not giving up on us, but for pursuing us to bring us to yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is how our invitation is going to work this morning. Uh, for those of you who came today and you want to see this message go around the world through the things that are made possible through the Annie Armstrong offering, we've got two baskets up here. And as our worship team leads us in singing together, I'm going to encourage you to slip out and come put your gift in the basket. Maybe you're here today and the gift you need to bring to God is yourself. Maybe you've never heard any of this before, or you've heard it and you've fought against it, but today is the day, and you're ready to surrender and open your life to Christ. I'll be standing here at the front. I'm going to invite you to come down and just tell me that. Maybe you've already invited Christ to come into your life, and you've put your faith in Him, but you're ready to go public now and tell the world by following Him in baptism. This is your opportunity to let us know you're ready to take that step, and we'll get that machinery in motion. Maybe you're a believer, you've been baptized, you're looking for a church family to be a part of, and you believe God's led you here. And you want to be part of what he's doing here. Again, this is your opportunity to come and let us know that. And we'll walk you through what comes next. However God's leading you today, I can't think of a better day than Easter Sunday to step out in faith and be obedient and surrender yourself to him. I'm going to ask you to stand now. Let's sing together. And if God's leading you, you step out in faith and come today.
If such a thing as grace exists, then grace was made for lives like these. There are no strangers. There are no outcasts. There are no orphans of God. So many fallen, but Easter today. Thank you all for being here. Just a couple of quick announcements. I know we all probably got family things we need to get to. Uh, teenagers, youth, Wednesday night, we're welcoming our new youth minister, Seth Johns. He's going to be leading our study on, on Wednesday night. And is that still at six? Or six? Or six. Okay, six o'clock Wednesday night up here in the Unity Building or in the Youth Center actually next to it. And uh, if, you're, if you're in grades six through 12, I invite you to come and be part of that. Uh, we're going to have a great time on Wednesday night. We also start at 6 30. We've got things for the younger kids in our children's church building, our kids' corner, and we also have a, a study for adults as well. And adults, we're going to be starting a brand new study this week, uh, juggling around a couple things uh, looking at, but uh, we'll be kicking that off on Wednesday night. So I invite you to come to start out the first uh, fresh ground floor with us on, on Wednesday night. Next Sunday, we're going to be kicking off a new sermon series based on the book of James. We're calling it Real Religion. We spent the first quarter of this year looking at what we believe, looking at some of those basic core Christian beliefs that, that all Christians hold in common. And we're going to spend the next several weeks looking at how those beliefs shape how we behave. And let me tell you, James is going to challenge us. He's going to make us uncomfortable in some areas, but he's going to challenge us to follow Jesus more closely. So I encourage you to be here next week for the first part of this uh, as we begin looking through the and preaching through the, the book of James, talking about real religion. we got a lot of other stuff coming up soon. Uh, we'll be letting you know more about that in the next couple of weeks, but it's an exciting time to plug in at New Salem. Thank you all for being here. God bless you. Have a happy Easter. <laughs>